welcome back to the Chronicles of Aguna, sponsored by Loser Paul. I'm your host, Harry Simiu, and on this week's show, we'll be reflecting on the victories in Baku and, of course, SW6 down at Craven Cottage. Joining me later on in the show are two debutants, Mystic Mems, and my colleague from over at the same old Arsenal podcast, Graham Brooks. They're both great and I'm sure you'll enjoy listening to them both together. But first, you're going to have to listen to me for a few minutes or if you don't really want to do that, you can fast forward this part. But please don't. (laughs) So I know everybody's itching to hear about the Fulham win, but I think it would be wrong of me or, or us to overlook what was a very good result away from home in Europe last Thursday. I have to say, though, I absolutely hate those 6 p.m. kickoff times. I mean, they've even bloody introduced it into the Champions League this year, and it's so fucking inconvenient, to be honest. There's so many, you know, there's only so many excuses, I should say, that you can make at work to ensure that you get home in time. You know, how many doctor's appointments can somebody have? How many times can their boiler break and they've got to wait for a plumber to come along? Or how many times have you got a, a massive delivery coming that you need to rush home for? I mean, I'm getting sick of it. I'm running out of, of reasons to give. It was a long trip to Azerbaijan, played in front of a huge crowd and a number of the first teamers, as you'd call them, were left out of the starting eleven. But Unai certainly took a strong squad out there with him. The bench had Martinez on it, who was our only other fit goalkeeper. Bellerin, Lacazette, Ozil, Torreira, Mustafi and Xhaka. And I guess with the exception of the goalkeeper, you'd have expected all of them to start at the weekend. Well, all of them did start at the weekend, apart from Ozil, who was out injured. Now, I'd seen some people question his decision to take such a strong squad out there out of concern around picking up injuries, fatigue, etc., etc. And I guess in years gone by, somebody like Mesut Ozil would have been left behind and, and the same probably could have been said for Lacazette, maybe particularly during the early group stages. I guess that's a sign of, of times changing. You know, this is one squad. This is not as Arsene Wenger used to play it, you know, one midweek team and, and one Premier League team. This is one squad and, and no fixture is below anybody, no matter who they are. Of course, Socrates, Emil Smith-Rowe and Gwenduzi all scored their first goals for the club. Senior goal in uh, Emil Smith-Rowe's case. Socrates won't score an easier goal than that in his career, if I'm being honest. It sort of just hit him and and the ball changed course and and ultimately beat the goalkeeper. Emil Smith-Rowe took his chance really well, I thought. Although he wasn't as effective overall as I've seen him previously, and that, don't get me wrong, that's not a criticism. He's still very, very young, has a lot to learn, but that goal will do him the world of good, you know, in terms of his confidence. Because aside from the goal, I don't think he had his greatest game. But having said that, up until that point, I don't think anybody played particularly well out there. Um, Gwenduzi's finish was also really good as well, and you could see what it meant to him uh, getting off the mark, and it was a good finish low in the bottom corner. Um, thoroughly enjoyed that one. I don't think the three at the back formation that we started with worked all that well, if I'm completely honest. But to Emery's credit, he changed it. And I guess from your manager, that's all you can ask. You know, we're all human. We all make mistakes. But it it takes a a good coach and and a big man to swallow his pride and and rectify the error as early as he did. Um, You know, we've seen so far that Unai is not afraid to change things if if they're not going uh, as planned. So that's nice to see, and that's certainly a positive in his column. In terms of the Europa League, it's it's maximum points so far. We've got a trip to Lisbon next, and, you know, I expect them to prove a a much sterner test than Vorskla or Karabag, respectively. But based on what we've seen and how seriously Unai Emery appears to be taking this competition, you've got to fancy us to go through as group winners and and with relative ease. And that's not me being cocky. That's me measuring Arsenal against the rest of our group and and saying that we're we're the standout team. I know we've not played Lisbon yet, but I can't imagine they're going to pose us too many problems. So, you know, I'd expect Arsenal to win the group. Now, moving on to Sunday, just when I thought there wasn't a shitter kickoff time than 6 p.m. on a weeknight, we ended up with a 12 p.m. kickoff on a Sunday away. And if I'm not mistaken, we had one at 12 p.m. at home last season against Brighton. And I remember being really pissed off about that as well. Um, 
I was out the night before celebrating the engagement of some friends, woke up a little bit worse for wear, headed over to the local playing fields to support my Sunday league team from the sidelines because, once again, I'm fucking injured, and uh, left with half an hour to go so I could get back in time for the Arsenal game. Um, and, and it has to be said, you know, I, I really, really enjoyed it. It ended Fulham 1, Arsenal 5. What a performance. Felt like we finally got our Arsenal back. And I know a lot of people have been saying that and it's been thrown around a bit of a cliche at the minute. But, you know, it's true. Arsenal are back and, and the fans were singing it on Sunday. I was singing it in my living room um, and, you know, getting funny looks from my wife and, and a friend who was around. But that's... That's how I felt, you know, I felt genuine joy and, and passion and it, it felt like a throwback to the Wenger glory days, I guess. The selection was a bit of a surprise. Welbeck, Iwobi and Mikitarian were all included from the start. Holding came in for Socrates. Ramsey was left out. Um, Ozil was ruled out due to a back problem and Aubameyang was feeling under the weather during the week. So I'm guessing that's probably why he was left out or, or certainly that would have played a part in Emery's decision. Aside from the obvious, though, uh, you know, that we have the best strike pair in the league, there's a much better feeling around the club this season. And I felt what this fixture did highlight it more than anything was the strength that we have in depth. You know, we've got a squad who are all competing for places. And Emery's shown that he'll pick his team on merit. He's clearly got the best out of Welbeck and Iwobi, for example, and he's trusting them as paid off. You know, Iwobi particularly was causing Fulham all sorts of problems on the left. Powerful dribbling, skill, end product, and, and you can feel the confidence really uh, flowing through him. These players are, are feeling like part of the project, part of the squad, rather than just the second string, and, and that helps. You know, there's a real unity there. Lacquer's first goal, uh, the opening goal on the day, brilliantly taken. Uh, you know, as were all of them, but I particularly loved that he ran over to Aubameyang on the sidelines to celebrate. And, and that's the kind of bromance that you want to see within the ranks. There's nothing fake about it. It is real chemistry. From Aubameyang's perspective, to be so happy for the player who's effectively preventing you from playing your favoured position is rare and, and completely kills all the stories that Aubameyang was a bit of a troublemaker in the past, particularly during his time at Dortmund. In terms of Mkhitaryan's impact, I didn't think he really staked the claim, but it was funny because a friend of mine who only saw the highlights was full of praise for him. And, you know, he certainly made some telling contributions. The weight on that pass for the Ramsey goal being the standout one for me. I mean, if that was Ozil, people would have been drooling, you know. And I guess maybe as fans, it's time that we focused on what players actually do do rather than what they don't do. And and Mkhitaryan made some telling contributions at the weekend. Um, I personally wanted to see a little bit more from him in terms of trying to stake his claim for a permanent place in the starting eleven. But, you know, he, he's a vital member of the squad and he's he done the business. So maybe I'm being a little bit too harsh. Burn Leno in goal. Um, you know, the early signs are that he's going to keep Pet a check out of the side going forward. I would say so anyway. Um, he made some good saves out in Carabag as well. And I, I don't blame him for Andre Schurler's goal. I think Monreal gave the ball away. And once Schurler was in, that was just a fine finish and, and the finish of an experienced forward. Is there an argument that maybe we move the ball quicker and more comfortably out of the defence when the German is in between the sticks? I think we'll be able to make that judgment in a few weeks when he's had four or five Premier League games on the spin. Um, he certainly looks more comfortable with the ball at his feet. But aside from that, he's made some brilliant saves as well. He seems to be sharp getting down low, um, you know, and, and his starting position is a lot more advanced. Uh, and, and maybe that helps him to react to things quicker. Uh, I don't know. He just seems a, a little bit sharper than check it in in some senses. Aaron Ramsey started on the bench, of course. Now, this is a difficult one. You know, what do you do with him? Because, you know, as we know, the future is looking bleak for him, not in terms of his career, but in terms of at Arsenal. There's no contract been agreed as of yet. Would you continue to use him as normal or, or are you reluctant to select him uh, given the situation? It, it's a really difficult one. Mike Stavrou on last week's show was adamant that he'd drop him altogether, but I don't think it's as simple as that, if I'm honest. Um, you know, has all hope of a contract being agreed gone? 
We don't know. Um, he can be an asset to this team, I guess, at least for the remainder of his contract. And my hope is everyone can stay professional and, and that both parties can benefit for the remainder of the contract or, or at least until he's sold on in January, if that's to be the case. I think the best thing for me about Sunday in particular was and and still is the feeling that we're back to our best or, or something close to it. You know, confidence is there. Fans are much more positive. The players are wearing the shirt with pride. And Arsenal is just a, a far happier environment. It's, you know, it's closer to the environment required for success than we've seen in years. And I don't want to get carried away, but I've got to say that I'm pretty fucking happy with things right now. So, you know, exciting times ahead and and it's a bit of a shame that the international breaks come now and and interrupted our momentum but you know fingers crossed we can bounce back against Leicester and uh, carry on where we left off Uh, just a few interesting stats and facts uh, following from Sunday's game I shamelessly stole these from uh, various articles today so I'm not taking credit for them I didn't do the research I'm just relaying them to you loyal listeners uh, for your own you know benefit and you can use them in pub quizzes and bit of trivia down you know wherever it is you drink with your friends um so the first one is arsenal have a 51 and a half percent win rate in premier league london derbies we've won 124 out of the 241 that's the best in the division in contrast fulham have the lowest win rate in these games with 20.7 percent they've only won 25 out of 121 Arsenal have won four of their past five away Premier League matches and that's as many as they had won in their previous 19 on the road so we certainly seem to have rectified that issue at least for the time being Alexander Lacazette has been directly involved in six goals in five starts in the Premier League so far this season four goals two assists Uh, Pierre-Emerick Aubameyang has had a hand in more goals in all competitions in 2018 than any other player at the club. 16 goals, 5 assists. So not only does he score, you know, he contributes in other ways as well, laying chances on for his teammates, which is is lovely to see. So it's another string to his bow, I guess. Um, Aaron Ramsey scored Arsenal's third goal just 39 seconds after coming on as a sub. The fastest Premier League goal by an Arsenal substitute since December 2007. I mean, what a goal it was. What an absolutely fantastic goal it was. And I think, you know, yeah, people have raved about Ramsey's finish and, and it was good and I'm I'm not saying it isn't and I'm not taking that away from him. But I think Mikitarian's pass was was the key in that goal, you know, to take that on the spin and the weight was perfect. And and like I said earlier on, had, had Mesa Ozil done that, people would have been raving and ranting about it or had David Silva done it or or someone else of that sort of mould. You know, we've been going on it we'd be going on about it for weeks. So, you know, fair play, brilliant. Um, and, and I really enjoyed it, really enjoyed that goal, really enjoyed the performance overall. Uh, that's it from me, I think. I'm going to take a short break, and when I return, we'll get some guests on. Welcome back to the Chronicles of Aguna, episode 29. My guests this week, Graham Brooks of the Same Old Arsenal podcast. Graham, welcome, making your Chronicles debut. How you doing, my friend? I'm doing really well, mate. Thanks for having me on the show. Anytime, Graham. Anytime. You're always welcome. And Mems, how you doing? Mr. Mystic Mems, he's been done with late. <laughs> I have, mate. I've got I called a few things right, which is unusual for me, but uh, I know, I know. thanks for having me on, uh, <laughs> HE. And uh, it's a pleasure to be joined also by Graham as well. Legend. Thank you so much. Oh, that's very kind, Mems. Our feelings are mutual. You know, I think that, um, you know, I used to follow you a lot when you used to do the old... Uh, Arsenal fan TV sort of like yeah, show you used to do after games. I used to really enjoy what you did on that. And, and I love Harry. Since I've been uh, working with Harry on the same old pa- podcast, same old Arsenal podcast, really is what, what a talented sort of guy he is. So knowledgeable exactly. about uh, Arsenal. So it's a, it's a privilege, to be on his, privilege to be on his show. Yeah, oh, stop it. Oh, stop it. <laughs> 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 Guys, um, right. So let's let's talk about Sunday's game. And I know from speaking to Graham earlier that he was impressed with the formation or system that Unai Emery opted to go with. Why do you think it was possible for him to go with a 4-4-2? And, and under maybe Wenger, it just seemed like a no-go for so many years. Is that to me? Yeah, it's to uh, you. <laughs> uh, <laughs> 
When he's I, talking I, about tactics, mate, it goes to you. It don't come to me. You're, you're, you're a tactical man. Well, I think the, th- the first thing to say, uh, Harry, is that um, the first thing I will say is that uh, Emery is quite adaptable. Uh, I think in the last week, uh, he's used three different formations in Arsenal games. Uh, when we beat Watford, it was 4-2-3-1. Uh, when we went away to Carabag in the uh, Europa League, he went for a, a 3-4-3. And I think what Emery does is he looks at the opposition and identifies weaknesses. Uh, and I, I think that uh, one thing I thought... He, he, he probably done is to, he, he looked at the Fulham. Uh, I think that uh, he's been trying things out. Uh, and also I think his selections might have been uh, made for him in the fact that um, obviously Ozil was unfit with a back spasm. Uh, the fact that Aubameyang had been ill all week. Uh, and obviously Ramsey, he decided not to play him with all the contract talk going on. So I think he looked at the players available to him, looked at the opposition and thought, well, I haven't tried this 4-4-2 yet. Um, uh, I think that it might be effective against Fulham, and that's why he chose that formation. I think he was helped by the way Fulham set up. They set up in a three-four-three. Christie, the uh, the right-sided defender, was always out of position. Uh, but the thing I liked about it is that every player, and this is something that I've been saying all season, a four-four-two suits the players we've got. And I thought that um, we were a f- this was our best performance of, of the season, and it wasn't lost on me. It, it came with all the players in their best positions. So the way I saw it was he set up in a four-four-two. I've been calling for a diamond midfield four actually all season uh, with Ozil at the uh, top of a, of a diamond with a Terrera at the base. But in fact, he went a four four two with four defenders, two DMs, two wide players and two forwards, which occasionally the system flipped around uh, into a four two two two. But it was essentially most of the time a four four two with Welbeck tucked in next to uh, Lacazette. Welbeck putting himself about winning headers, uh, Lacazette playing off him. And Mkhitaryan out wide, mostly on the right, but coming inside occasionally, and Wobi out wide left. So um, I think he the system, I think, was partly looking at Fulham uh, and also looking at the players available to him. Uh, and basically, I think he, he was he's basically adapting it in Emery. And I think he's trying out the systems. He's trying out uh, players in various systems. And I think that, um, you know, I think it was a combination that probably more, I have to say, thinking about it, his choice would have been made for him with the... Uh, Ozil back spasm and the uh, Bamiyang being ill all week. So I think that was partly, that, that was probably the main reason in my opinion. Okay. Um, Mims, Graham's touched on the fact that Aaron Ramsey was left out of the starting lineup and obviously he came on, he started a move and, and finished it sublimely. Uh-huh. For, in my opinion, his celebration seemed a little bit half-hearted. It wasn't as passionate as he's historically been after just having scored a goal for us. In your opinion, am I reading into that too much and, no, mate. I think your uh, your analysis is bang on, and I agree with you. He's he's almost like when he scored, he was like, "Well, there you go. That's what I can do." That was what that was what his celebration was. I think was intended to say, you know. And it's it's unfortunate for Aaron because um, he's been you know, he's, he's he's had a fantastic season a couple of years ago, and then he's had injuries, and he's been sort of brilliant one week and then he's disappeared for a couple of weeks after and he hasn't really shown that consistency over the last couple of years of course he scored important goals for us particularly in the FA Cup but um, I think Emery's looked at the situation uh, along with the Arsenal uh, top principals there and they're looking at how much money Aaron Ramsey potentially wants and they probably think that they could probably get more value for money uh, elsewhere Um, now you've got to look at things from Aaron Ramsey's perspective as well I mean if he's looking at Mesut Ozil was on a reported over £300,000 a week, then he probably wants a, a little slice of that cake as well. So whether or not he's going to get that elsewhere, I don't know. But it's it's certainly something that Unai Emery is, I think, managing quite well. Because if you've got a player who's not sort of committed and there's some sort of doubt over his future, I think having him on a bench is 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 a, is a the, the correct way of managing it. So um, I do feel sorry for Aaron Ramsey because I, I do feel that he's, he's been a good player for us over the years but um, I've really got to trust the, the management on this and if they think that they can get better value for money I think we've got to, got to go along with it unfortunately anyway, mate. Yeah I think you've hit the nail on the head there I think it is about getting value for money I think from Unai Emery's point of view and I, I said this on the podcast last week he's probably thinking that if I'm going to give up such a huge proportion of my wage budget then it's got to be in a position where I don't have other options like Iwobi like Ozil um, yeah. like Mikitarian. and I think that's what it comes down to I don't think it's because Aaron Ramsey isn't a good player hasn't been a good servant to this club and, and doesn't 
hold any value. I think it's just purely down to that. He's unfortunate that we have other players in that position or capable of playing in that position. And, and unfortunately his demands are just slightly too high at the moment. Um, yeah. I mean, Sunday saw us register our ninth consecutive victory. Graham, how are you feeling about Unai Emery's era so far? Is it what you expected? Is it more? Is it less? Um, I, th- I think that uh, slowly but surely the work he's doing is starting to have an impact. Um, I think that he's uh, built up pretty much what I thought he would do. Uh, he's big on work ethic. He's big on team spirit. Um, and I think that he's big on attitude of his players. Um, I think that um, uh, he's created a, a bond in the camp quite quickly. Uh, I think he, he's obviously bought into the culture of Arsenal Football Club. Uh, he, he obviously realises how important the fans are, and I think he's developing a spirit now, uh, not only in the club, uh, sorry, in the in the team, but in the fan base in the club. Uh, and I think he's doing the right things. Um, I think that uh, he very much is a sort of like a manager who who, who sort of like. Uh, buys into the values of clubs. That's clear from every press conference I've seen him give. He's very strong on work ethic and the work that he, he mentions the word work a lot. Uh, and I think that he obviously sort of like uh, expects the players to work really hard. Um, and I think that we're seeing a change in the mentality uh, that that's, uh, comes from uh, players now sort of like um, – collectively and individually wanting to do well for each other. I'm not saying they never did un, uh, under Wenger, but I think the thing is it grew a little bit stale towards the end. I think he's come in with new ideas uh, and invigorated the club. Um, he's still a work in progress. I think he'd admit that, but I think he's pretty much doing what I thought he would do. Um, it's going to take time. We've said that before. It's not going to happen overnight. We're still uh, a long way behind the top clubs. But I think that we're going in the right di- direction. And I think he sees it as a project. I think he sees it this season as progression of implementing his ideas, looking at the squad of players he's got. I think the Aaron Ramsey situation was uh, a clear statement that he probably he feels that uh, having looked at Aaron Ramsey pre-season now and in games, that uh, um, probably doesn't fit uh, where he uh, wants to play him. Uh, he doesn't see him as a number eight playing in the midfield three. He's used him as a number 10. As you said yourself, Harry, last week, uh, probably doesn't trust him at number eight. He had a chance to play him there uh, early in the season. So I think that he, he's assessing it. I think it's pretty much uh, going where we thought it would go, I believe. I think the results we're achieving now, uh, again, we achieved a lot of those results under Wenger. But I just think there's a different mentality about this group. Uh, and I think he's certainly stamping his... Uh, personality on the club and on the team. And I, and uh, I think that's a good thing. Well, yeah, totally agree. Mems, one of the players that has really come a long way under Unai Emery is Alex Iwobi. I mean, what on earth has he been feeding him? <laughs> <laughs> well, do you know what? I mean, Harry, it's, um, last season I went to a few games and I saw Iwobi playing for Arsenal. And he, it, it's strange with Alex Iwobi because when he first burst onto the scene, there was an away game at Everton, which sticks into the mind when he scored a goal. And we all looked at it this thing, wow, this kid's going to be special. But he didn't quite fulfil his early potential. And he, he was quite frustrating last season in particular. He was overhitting crosses. He was getting caught in position. He was gifting the ball away a lot. His work rate was, wasn't really quite there. Um, he was doing little bits on social media as well, which sort of irritated some fans as well, because it almost like that in his mind, he made it when he didn't quite make it, if that makes sense. But now this season, he just looks like a totally different player. It almost like a switch was flicked in Alex Iwobi's head that he needed to work hard, that he didn't quite make it. And he, and, and now we're seeing the player that we hope to see. And, and people like myself who questioned him have now been, proved wrong and we're eating humble pie and and we want to eat humble pie i mean i love humble pie because it means that you know people are proving us wrong but do you know, do you know, um, he, do you know what i think mems I, I i i'll come in i hope you don't mind me coming in here i okay. just think he was i just think i don't know if harry agrees i just think he was managed poorly by arson wenger i think mm-hmm. when he lost form he should have taken him out the team and he kept playing him and that resulted yeah. in him losing confidence yeah. and i think his performances got affected i just don't i think one thing we talked uh, uh, in the last question about Emery, well, he, he manages players really well. Uh, and and yeah. I think that that's, uh, to me, whether 
Uh, Wenger towards the end lost the knack of managing players. I don't know, but certainly a I was thinking last year he was playing him when he was clearly out of form and struggling for confidence. Yeah. Whereas uh, I think under uh, Emery, I think he's sort of like he looks. I know Wenger used to look at uh, stats and all that, but he's more interested in the science, how much they run. <laughs> but I think uh, uh, Emery's interested in performance, uh, and, and I, th- I think that he manages players, he makes them feel part of the structure, um, and and I think that. Um, uh, Awobi, he's managed him really well. He, he said to all the players, like Leno Awobi, your chance will come. So sort of keep yeah. working hard. He's, again, it comes back to this word with Emery, work. Keep working, yeah. keep working, your chance will come. Uh, and I think that's, that, that, you know, it's up to them to take their chance. I think it's Leno's now, he's got to take his chance. He's got that mm-hmm. fortune with the check injury. And Awobi now is getting a run in the team. And, you know, and I think that if he takes his chance and performs, I think, honestly, uh, I think he'll stick with him. I think last year, I think he just lost his way. Uh, he was a young yeah. lad also that came into the team, Mems, uh, at a very young age. And I just think he was, um, the team was obviously struggling last year and he just lost confidence. And I think Wenger no. didn't manage it correctly last year. That's my view on it, Harry. No, I, I agree. And to be honest with you, last, last season, I felt that Alex Awobi should maybe go out on, on loan because I think that yeah. at, at, at Arsenal, he, he, he wasn't, like you said, being managed correctly, because he, yeah. there's no doubt that the lad, the lad has talent. But I think mm. what you what you said, Graham, is the way Emery's managed him has certainly mm. helped him, and I think he's, he's now getting that confidence as well. One thing that you've you, you touched on as well about the way that Emery's managing players. I mean, I've seen a massive improvement in Rob Holding this year, this mm. season as well. Bellerin, yeah. Bellerin yeah. looks like a better, uh, a more sort yeah. of a. Uh, he's getting it now. He's working hard. Granite Shaka as well. So there's mm. players that even even Lacazette. Last season, mm. his confidence weren't quite there. He, he looks like he's at like another level. So players have improved. And I think what you said as well is about the way that Emery has managed his players and given his players confidence. He hasn't come in trying to make a name for himself, you know, Emery. Mm. And he could he could have done that by dropping Pet Check and starting mm. Leno at the start of the season. He had opportunity to, so, you know, some managers want to come in like, like a Mourinho or something like that and say, look, I'm the boss now. I'm, yeah. I'm putting my stamp on this team. He hasn't yeah. done that, Emery. He's allowed natural sort of progression and natural yeah. things to happen. I mean, giving Czech the number one shirt was the right thing to do. Uh, making Lauren Koscielny the captain, even though he was injured, was the right thing to do. Get, and he's done everything the correct way. And I think that's demanded respect from the players. I think the players are enjoying working underneath him. Uh, like you said, he's giving them confidence. I think the tactics are mm. changing things around. I think what we've got at the moment, especially under Emery, where you can see with Awobi that the players are, are, are enjoying here, I think we were in a right good place at the moment. And I, I think it's it's early days. I don't want to be saying that, you know, what what he's doing is, is definitely going to win us the title, but I think, think certainly we're going in the right direction. Mm. Yeah, totally agree. And I, I think the man management is is key. And I think particularly when you're talking about young players, you know, they're going to have ups and downs. I've always said that one of the hardest things for a young player to discover is consistency. Yeah, and, and when you get a knock, you need a manager there that's going to put his arm around you and pick you back up again and, and help you through it. And I, I'm not saying, you know, with Arsene Wenger, I think he just got a little bit he had one way and that was applied across the board. And there are certain players that need certain treatment. Some players need their arm around them. Some players need to get a bollock in, you know, it it just depends on the player. And I think maybe we had a blanket approach in the past and and some people suffered because of that. Um, But, you know, Mems, you touched on it as well. That was going to be my next question. Rob Holding. I mean, he's looked assured when he's coming, hasn't he? He's, He's done Really, yes. really well. I mean, to be honest with you, I was surprised when Callum Chambers was allowed to go out on loan because I thought at the time Chambers was slightly ahead of Rob Holding. When Rob Holding came in um, during that FA Cup run and played in the FA Cup final against Diego Costa, he was immense. But then last season, it was almost like he went backwards. You know, he was giving the ball where his head went. And But this season so far, uh, I mean, in the two games that he's played, I mean, he, he's, he's looked awesome. So I don't know what's happened again, whether we're not you know, it's confidence or whether it's, it's something's happened to these players where they've, they've just stepped it up. I mean, winning breeds confidence, doesn't it? Lads? I mean, you've got nine games on a, on a winning streak. Of course your players are, you know, got to be a bit more freedom, but something's happened over Arsenal and, and players like holding, I mean, like we said, Bellerin, et cetera, Wobie, they're just looking that much better. I mean, holding for me, if he kept, carries on on this, it's going to be very difficult uh, for Koscielny to get back in the team. I mean, at the moment, we've got Mustafi, uh, Socrates and, and Holding. I mean, this weekend, I mean, he mixed things up a bit. I don't know if Socrates was injured or not, but he played in midweek, uh, scored a goal. 
and I was, I was fully expecting it to be Mustafi uh, uh, and, and Socrates, but he stuck with Holding, and I thought Holding was brilliant again. So it's a good dilemma for Emery to have, and it's nice that he's mixing things up as well, but he's, he was also showing loyalty to some players as well, which is nice. You know, if they're playing well, we keep them in the team, so it's good. long may it continue. That's right. He, he's selecting his side on merit, isn't he, rather than reputation, yeah. and, and that's, mm. that's massive. You know, I think uh, I mentioned it to, to Graham earlier on the same old Arsenal podcast. I think that everyone feels like part of the project now. Everyone can be yeah. trusted to do a job, and, and that breeds confidence into players. We've seen it with Iwobi. We've seen it with Holding. We've seen mm. it with Welbeck. I mean, <laughs> Danny Welbeck this season has been incredible when he's played. So it, yeah. it, it just goes to show... Massive, even massive even Lich, even Lichsteiner, mate, Lichsteiner on Twitter, you know, he's 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 hardly played this season, but he's he's tweeting after every game when we won. Come on, we're going to keep this run going. I mean, what you know, what a signing he's been, and he's not even played a game, but just to have him amongst uh, the squad, just almost like to be there with his experience, it, it just shows like what you've just said as well. Every player feels like they're a part of this squad, and and they've got their part to play, and it's. And that's all down to the manager that he's managed to achieve that. That's right. And I I can't remember which change it was, but I was watching the game on TV yesterday. And when uh, Unai Emery made a substitution, I I can't think which player it was that made their way over to the bench. And then you you saw Licksteiner literally stand up on the subs bench and make sure like he said, well done to the player and high five and all that. It just shows that he's a real leader in the dressing room. Just my final question for you guys. And I'm going to put it to Graham first. Um, You know, of course, it's an international break now. Do you think being on a run of nine games, do you think it'll be good for us to have a rest considering that we had that midweek trip to Azerbaijan or do you think that it could have a negative impact maybe and, and disrupt our momentum? I think when you're on a winning run, I think you want the players want to play. Um, mm. uh, that's what I feel. Uh, I just think that it, there's arguments for it both ways and uh, it give you a rest, give the players to recharge their battery. And you've got to remember the, the, the likes of Ozil, uh, who's coming back off that injury, admittedly the back spasm, uh, 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 no longer in international football. Um, and Lacazette uh, today has been omitted from the French squad, so th- they will get a rest. But I think when you, I think football is my... From what I know, reading about footballers, they just want to play football and, and uh, they just want to keep playing games. So, And I think the thing is, we've got this momentum that we've built. I think the players, in, in a way, would want a, the, a game to come around quicker. I think the one thing it does do, it gives Emery the chance once again to work on the training ground, which sometimes when you're playing uh, three games in a week, that's not always available to you because you're playing, say, uh, I don't know, sort of like Sunday, Thursday, Sunday or whatever we're playing. So there's less work done on the training field. So it gives him the opportunity, I think, to get the players, sit them down again, start running through his ideas, looking back over what they've achieved. I'm sure we'll be looking at videos, analysing what they could do better. I think the one thing he's brought to the team is um, uh, an intensity now where we match teams. I spoke about this on the same old Arsenal podcast with you, Harry. I think that he gives a great value to not conceding the first goal. So I think that work uh, will carry on uh, uh, that you know the, the work ethic that he's brought and uh, he'll use the international break I think to work players those that need to be rested and recover from injuries will do so so I think it's a 50-50 really and answer your question yes I think that um, um, a rest is sometimes good but I think he'll use the, the break to work with the players but I think footballers just love that to play games don't they so and we have got this momentum going so you know there's an argument that you just want to keep playing so Yes, yeah, so it's a difficult one to answer. I think there's arguments uh, both ways, but uh, that's my take on it, mate. Mems? I agree. No, I agree with Graham. Is it yeah. bang on, mate? I mean, to be honest with you, when when things are going your way, you just want to keep on playing. You know, if you've got the momentum, if you if you're you know if if everything you touch is turning into gold, then why do you want it to stop? So, yeah, I, I think that it's it's an unfortunate time for an international break to happen, but. Uh, I think I think Emery's uh, what what Graham said as well. He will use this opportunity to look at the things. And one thing I've noticed, Graham, as well, is that we seem to be particularly strong in the second half of games this yeah. season. When you yeah. look at our first half performances, we've been quite slow starting, but we've sort of like got stronger. The games gone gone on, and we look towards the end of the games. Last twenty minutes, we're scoring a majority of our goals. Whether or not that's a, a different fitness regime that we're doing, or something that tactically we're doing, I think with Emery as well, the substitutions that he's making as well at key times of the games as well is is every substitution that he's doing has been quite positive. And and the, think... the subs that uh, sorry, mate, go on. Yeah, I was just going to say, Mem, sorry to interrupt you. I think there's two reasons for that. One, I think that um, in terms of tactically, I think that 
he puts a big value on not conceding the first goal. So sometimes we start slowly. We fit, I think he wants the players to feel their way into the games and, and sort of like just make sure that they're solid in that first 20 minutes and that central midfielders under Wenger, I think central midfielders just had no accountability. They just used to roam up out of position and we were open through the central midfield. I think he likes us to be more solid in that first 20 minutes, puts a big value on the first goal. So the players sort of like start maybe slow. I still want to you always tell when Arsenal are playing well because they move the ball quickly with fast passing, accurate, quick passing. But I think he puts big value on the first goal. And secondly, I think, in answer to your point about scoring a lot of late goals, I think the players no doubt are fitter this season. Emery's worked them hard, continues to work them hard. And I think that's showing up with scoring a lot of late goals, including that fantastic late goal uh, that Ramsey scored yesterday. Uh, we were discussing earlier which is the better goal on the same old Arsenal, uh, Wil- Wiltshire or uh, Ramsey. So I, I know Harry and me had our, our opinion on it. I don't think Harry <laughs> and mine. If I ask you, Mems, which goal do you think was the better goal? Ramsey's at Fulham or Wiltshire's against Norwich at the Emirates a few years ago? I think they're both beautiful goals, mate. And it's it's, it's like <laughs> asking me to decide which which one of my twin boys I like most, you know. I can't, <laughs> I can't, I can't, I can't tell you, mate. They're both beautiful. I love them both. Yeah. <laughs> that was easy then and just one, one final question because Mem said he, he likes eating humble pie um, Mems you prefer it to baglava or <laughs> <laughs> mate the size of my gut recently I've been eating far too much baklava I love it it's dripping in syrup all that pistachio nuts I love it we've well, got organised mate Harry you get Graham we get a few we, we'll do one of these podcasts up in Green Lanes Herringay or we'd have, a, we'd, have a, we'd, have, we'd have a Turkish meal and uh, talk about over the Arsenal. And I we can all it. sit there and eat, enjoy it. That'd be I, love nice, it. Eh? I, love a, I love a Turkish meal, so I'm up for that. <laughs> Sounds good. Sounds good. Guys, thank you so much for taking the time out of your day to join me. I know you're both really busy and I really, really do appreciate it. Graham, do you want to just quickly let our listeners know how they can follow you on social media? Yeah, I've, I'm on Twitter, Harry, on Graham B one nine five. As you know, I do interviews for Arsenal Fan TV, and uh, the the biggest blessing this year is actually finding you guys on the same old Arsenal podcast, uh, Lee Judges, uh, and Craig. Uh, shout out to Craig; he's not well at the moment. I wish him all the best. But if you oh, want to follow me, if, if you want to follow me on Twitter, uh, it's Graham B one nine five. Before I go, I just think it's great catching up with Mems again. I hope we should do this more often. Thank you, Graham. Absolute pleasure, mate. Top man. Cheers, pal. And and make sure you follow at same old AFC as well. It's a great podcast. Yeah, thank um, you. Even if I do say so myself. Uh, Mems, do you want to just let our listeners know how they can keep up to date with with you? Not really. I've got enough followers. <laughs> as it is. I don't want. To... <laughs> I don't want it anymore. I get far too much grief. But it's just best off to keep following you, Harry. You know, I follow you, and uh, I'm sure you see me re- being retweeted, mate. But uh, no, it's uh, I'm not on the social media to to get followers. I had a massive account and I deleted it because it was just getting far too many, too, too griefy. So I like a quiet life now. So don't follow me. Just you know, piss off. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, <that's fun. laughs> well that, that was a different response to what I was expecting, but yeah. <laughs> no, cheers. Guys, thank you so much. And I hope to have you both on again in the very near future. Thanks, mate. Cheers, Harry. Cheers, Harry. That brings us to the end of another episode. My thanks to Mems and Graham. It's been great fun chatting to you both. Thank you once again for coming on. Don't forget to subscribe to us on iTunes, YouTube, or wherever it is that you listen from. Leave us a review, five stars, of course, and follow us on Twitter at Chronicles underscore AFC. You can also support this podcast over at Patreon.com, where you can become a member for just $5 a month. This show will always be free. I want to make that clear but your contribution would support us in delivering a higher level of material even more regularly than we currently are and we'll also send you a gift from a choice of three available for more info head over there and take a peek don't forget this podcast is sponsored by Loserpool, a fantastic new betting game over at loserpool.com stay tuned until the very end for more information on that An international break does loom, which means there won't be a preview podcast this week, seeing as we aren't in action. Instead, I shall try and uh, make a dent in the long list of things my wife wants me to do in the house before the little one comes along early next year. God help me. Uh, Until next time. Cheers. Bye-bye. Meet our hero. 
He's a smart guy who loves sports and loves outwitting other people. Our hero needs to show the world his mastery of the game. Our hero does this by playing games at Loserpool. Our hero is you. Loserpool has two games. In the namesake, the games of an entire season are grouped together into weeks or rounds. After paying an entry fee, you choose one team to lose that week or round. If you're correct, you earn the right to repeat the process in the next round. But the catch is that you cannot choose a team a second time until all the teams have been chosen by you once. If you're knocked out early, you may re-enter the same pool by paying a penalty to make it fair for the other players. Or you may wait until the next pool starts in a few weeks. Razor Pool is similar to Loser Pool in that the games of an entire season are grouped together. But in this case, you pay the entry fee and predict the outcome of all the games in that week or round. You will be ranked against all other players according to your accuracy. And at the end of each round, a predetermined percentage of players will be eliminated. There is no option to buy back into a pool if you are eliminated, <laughs> and so you will have to wait until the next pool starts to play again. In both games, the prize money grows very rapidly. The pool is allocated to the last man standing, or to add a little drama, to a small surviving group if they vote according to predetermined rules. Loser Pool is about community, friendship, fun and rivalry. Discuss and debate the games and events of the week with players from around the world. Invite your friends and co-workers into your own sub-pools and see who can outsmart the group and earn bragging rights. This is your moment. Create an account. Show your sports genius. Be the hero.